when Jake was four years old, he was, uh, came up to Connie and, and just announced, I love to talk. <laughs> now, language and, and, and the ability to speak is a, is a great gift that God has given all of us. There are times that some of us would appreciate the gift more if some used it less, I'm sure. But this week I've been thinking about language and words in particular. I like to play with words. I like to, to look at them from different angles and, and, and discover new things that will help me communicate better. I just love language. So I wondered as I was thinking about that, is there a word, just one word, that you really enjoy, one that, that says something to you, one that communicates a profound truth. What would that word be if it was just one word? Love. What else? Jesus. Bible. What else? Huh? Redemption. Redemption. Salvation. Family. There we go. We're getting the hang of this thing. So there is one word that is more valuable and more important than any other word. And you can speak this word in any language and it will be profoundly meaningful. The self-improvement guru, Dale Carnegie, was onto something when he observed a person's name is the sweetest, most important sound in any language. The sweetest sound any person can hear is their own name. Think about that. When you, when you meet somebody for the first time, the most important thing that you can do for that person is remember their name. So that the next time you see them, you can call them by name. And that will say to them that you value them. That you took enough time in your own thought processes to listen, to pay attention, to remember their name. Now, just as a name can be sweet to our ears, it might also be unpleasant to someone else's ears. How do you feel when I say the name Adolf Hitler? What about Billy Graham? Jerry Sandusky? Tim Tebow? Depending on which side of the political aisle you are most comfortable, <coughs> Donald Trump? <coughs> Nancy Pelosi? Those two names, that's awesome. Those two names bring out some emotional impact. Now there's a name that's spoken in the last section of our study in the Gospel of Mark. Now this name, when we, when we say it, will bring out all kinds of, of feelings for you. Some will be things that you recognize immediately that are very positive and some might actually be very negative. But I want to say to us today that when we say this name, from this day forward, my prayer is that God will infuse this name with hope for you and me. Every time we hear this name, that God will remind us what we encounter today in the scriptures and that it would help us have hope in all that God is doing in our lives. So turn to Mark chapter 15. We'll start in verse 40. Mark chapter 15 and verse 40. If you don't happen, didn't happen to bring your Bible today, it's on page 713 in the Pew Bible in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, please take this home as our gift. We'd love for you to have God's word in your hands. Now before we get to the passage, we come to this part in the Gospel of Mark and it is the darkest day in Jesus' life on this earth. All Hope is gone. All hope drained from the disciples with every drop of blood that drained from Jesus' body. Jesus had been tried. He had been convicted. He'd been humiliated, degraded, abused, stripped naked, and hung before the public to see. And all the hope that his men had pinned on him was gone. They all ran. Their names 
were spoken that day, but only in whispered tones. And only in conversations like, well, I feel bad for James and John. They walked away from dad's business and they followed this deluded guy. Everything's falling apart. They were hopeless. Some of Jesus' followers, however, at this time, showed the steel in their spines. And they showed the courage that was theirs. Because they chose to be with Jesus throughout this difficult time. They never ran. They were always there. Look at verse 40. There were also women looking on from a distance among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and the, young, the younger and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Now, this is an astounding turn of events because there were the, many, many women in Jesus' entourage. You know, it's said that many of them followed him and ministered to him as he did his ministry throughout all the different regions of Israel. But most of those women were anonymous. I mean, think about it. You had the widow with two coins. Anybody remember her name? Never mentions her. We have, we have the, the widow lady whose son had died and Jesus raised him from the dead. We don't know her name. You have all different kinds of ladies whose names you do not know, but listen to what's happening here. You have three guys who had been following Jesus from the beginning. Peter, James, and John, they were nowhere to be found. So his inner circle was empty. But guess what? These women became his inner circle. They stood up with courage, and they said, we are going to minister to him. We're going to take care of him. They became his inner circle, but none of their names are the names that fill us with hope. They filled the inner circle, but they were not the ones that this passage draws our attention to to tell us that you can have hope throughout all of your life. There's a second person that shows up. He's a lone individual who shows up out of kind of nowhere. We don't have any idea that this guy is a follower of Jesus, but he shows up risking his life, his position, his power, his wealth, his everything because of what he chooses to do to honor Jesus' dead body. Verse 43. Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. What a risk he took. He didn't care about his position as a member of the Sanhedrin. He didn't care what people thought of him. He cared about Jesus. And what I think Joseph teaches us is that God's kingdom trumps everything else. When his earthly commitments ran afoul of his commitment to Jesus and his commitment to the kingdom of God, he would no longer hang in the shadows. He could no longer be silent. His commitment to the kingdom of God gave him the courage that he needed to step out and to do for Jesus what John the Baptist's disciples had done for him. To do for Jesus what his inner three at least should have done for him. Look at verse 44. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should already be dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. Now, why was this such a big deal? Since Joseph would be defiling himself by handling a dead body, he would not be able to participate in Sabbath rituals. He wouldn't be able to celebrate the Sabbath. Now, his membership as, as, as a part of the Sanhedrin put him in a very difficult position making this choice. Because the Sanhedrin, they were the ones that, that brought Jesus before Pilate, 
having accused him of blasphemy and found him guilty and convicted him. And they were the ones who brought the charge of, of treason against Jesus. So he's standing up against the strongest, most powerful governing body in all of Israel. He could not only lose his position, he could lose his life. Because Jesus, the dead body he'd be handling, is an example of what happens when you run up against religious leaders of Israel at that time. He took his own life into his hands. Now think about this. Remember last week, we pointed out that for the Romans, especially Pilate, for someone to claim to be Caesar, someone to claim to be king, they were taking their life into their own hands. Because Caesar was not going to put up with any kind of sedition like that. And so he went to the man who presided over condemning Jesus to crucifixion and death. And he said, can I please have his body? His commitment to God's kingdom gave him the courage. He was saying, I don't care what anyone thinks of me. I don't care what it might cost me. I am committed to Jesus. I am committed to his kingdom. That's why it says in verse 43 that he was also looking for the kingdom of God. To look for God's kingdom is not a passive activity. It's not the, the picture of somebody sitting on a bench wondering and waiting and hoping something happens to them that would be kind of like part of God's kingdom. Someone who's looking for the kingdom lives their life every day expecting God's kingdom to come. They live their life each day knowing, hoping with anticipation that Jesus will come back right now. So for someone who is looking for the kingdom, nothing else takes priority, no matter the cost, no matter the risk or sacrifice, the kingdom is worth it. The question that I have to ask myself as I think about that, and the question I want you to consider is, am I committed to God's kingdom like that? Am I willing to make whatever sacrifice, whatever cost, willing to pay? Whatever position I might lose, whatever relationship I might put in jeopardy, however my wealth might be challenged, am I willing to stand up for the kingdom of God? Is my commitment to the kingdom that valuable to me now we don't know if Joseph heard this parable but we certainly know that he understood the import of it when Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid and then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field Joseph was saying I've sold it all turned it over so I could have Jesus he is worthy of all of our sacrifice he's worthy of everything we can give it is not about us just becoming good people when we come into God's kingdom it is about Jesus ruling and reigning in me it's about him being the one who calls the shots in my life God's kingdom is wherever Jesus is ruling and reigning. To look for his kingdom is for you and I to live under the rule and reign of Jesus. So when Joseph was forced to choose, there was no choice in his mind. He didn't wonder if he should give up his reputation for the kingdom. He didn't, wasn't concerned with whether he should give up his position for the kingdom or his life for the kingdom. His kingdom commitment was the source of his courage. And he stood with God no matter what anyone else might have done. As disciples of Jesus. And that's what this entire study in the Gospel of Mark has been all about. What does it mean to follow Christ? What does it mean to be a disciple? When I say I'm a disciple of Jesus, I'm saying he is my king. 
He is your kingdom. The kingdom of God is alive and active when King Jesus rules and reigns in my life so that I take Jesus' words from Matthew 5 seriously when he said, pray this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth or in my life as it is in heaven. That's what a subject of the king does. That's what a disciple of Jesus does. Lives in the, that truth. Your kingdom come. That means I want you to rule and reign in me. I want the decisions I make to be decisions you would make. I want the way I handle my relationships, the way I handle my finances, the way I handle my business, the way I drive, all of it to be as a subject of the kingdom. Your kingdom come, your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. Now Joseph is a shining beacon of kingdom faith during this dark time, but his name is not the name that infuses us with the greatest hope. After his act of faith, he fades from the scene. Jesus is dead. And again, the women stepped up to honor, to complete the honor, excuse me, that Joseph had begun. Verse 1 of chapter 16. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, both bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And while they were there, they received a message from an angel. An angel who told them that he's not here. You're not going to find the living among the dead. But he gave them a message. A message that they were to take back to the 11. A message that infused within it are two words that are the source of our hope today and can be the source of your hope every single day from here on if you will take them seriously. Verse six, he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter. Go, tell his disciples and Peter. I told you I love language. And I, I like to take phrases and turn them around. What would it say to you if this angel said, he's, he's walking away. He says, go and tell his disciples. Oh, oh yeah, and Peter. How important is Peter? He's an afterthought. But what if he says, go and tell his disciples and make sure, make sure Peter knows I want him there. I think that's what he was saying. He was saying, Peter's still my guy. Peter had been the leader all along. Everybody knew it. Peter, James, and John had all run away, but Peter had famously, very publicly, turned his back on Jesus. And I think that God wanted Peter to know that your failure, Peter, is not final. Peter's name is probably the last one anyone expected to be spoken right then. He was the biggest name. He was the biggest, loudest, brashest person. And he turned away from his, his, his savior. You ever betrayed someone? Hurt them deeply? Maybe you cheated, stole from them, slandered them. Maybe you didn't keep a promise. Maybe you lied to them. Maybe you just have bad blood between you. How interested in seeing that person are you? I mean, think about how different Jesus is from us. You see, we judge ourselves the way we judge others. When, when somebody sins against me, when somebody blows it against me, 
I'm not interested in talking to them. I know I'm the only person in the room like that, right? We're all that way. Not Jesus. Not Jesus. He wanted Peter to know that he is important. Go tell my guys, especially Peter. Every one of his disciples had hung their heads in shame because they all walked away from him and Jesus did not rub it in their faces. They're still his guys. Jesus' plan was not over. Listen to that. Jesus' plan was not over. It was just beginning. If you have blown it, his plan for you is not over. It's just beginning. I stopped in the middle of verse 7. Go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Your failure is not final. Jesus' plan for you is not over. It's just beginning. He's waiting on the other side of your pain. He's waiting on the other side of your betrayal. He's waiting on the other side of your shame to meet with you and to work in your life. When we fail, it feels like the end, but it's only the beginning because Christ is waiting on the other side of that. Now, don't miss the human factor in this. We always think about how Jesus felt betrayed by Peter. I think Peter probably felt betrayed by Jesus. Let's be honest. Peter had walked away from everything. Peter had pinned all his hopes on Jesus. His expectation, though he was wrong-headed, we all know that, but his expectation was that Jesus was going to be the king and he was going to be on the, the, the throne next to him. He would be his right-hand guy. But Jesus let him down. He was disappointed, disillusioned, hurt, angry. You ever been disappointed with God? You ever felt disillusionment with God? You ever feel like, you know, God, you could have done something. You left me twisting in the wind. Even when we feel disappointed, when we feel like God has failed us, he's still there for us. He wants to meet our needs. He wants to speak to you and to work in your life as only he can. I've asked someone to come and share a testimony about how God has shown that to them. Text message out of the blue from her mother, which contained the lyrics and the lyrics. 
was, how did I get here? I'm not who I once was. And I'm crippled by the fear that I've fallen too far. You are more than the choices that you've made. You are more than the, pa- the sum of your past mistakes. You are more than the problems that you create. You've been remade. The lyrics to this song hit home for her. She quick put a few things together, hopped in her car, and called her mother from the road. Her mother immediately got on a flight to meet her and helped her with her drive home. No questions asked. God had truly shown her his unconditional love that day. An opportunity to leave that situation, an opportunity to reconnect with her family, an amazing friend who offered his home and unwavering support in the South Landing, and a family that would drop everything to help. There are some of you out there today that already know who this young lady was. She, who she is, who she was, has changed drastically since then, and I stand before you today, finally able to understand why God chose to put me through those seasons of life. To learn that Christ is always with you, that he will always show you what true unconditional love is. To lean on him when times get tough, to trust that he has a plan to use you for his glory and to help others. That same 10th Avenue North song goes on to say, but don't you know who you are? Don't you know what's been done for you? Don't you know who you are? Because this is not who, what you've done, but what's been done for you. This is not about where you've been, but where your brokenness brings you to. This is not about what you feel, but about what he felt to forgive you and what he made, what he felt to make you loved. You've been remade. For a long time, I had known that God had me go through these things for a reason, but I was struggling to come up with an answer to, as to what that reason was. I would pray to God that he would help me find some good in my past experiences, a reason why I had gone through what I had. As many of you know, I have recently started a new job back here in Colorado, working on a cutting horse ranch. Out there, in the middle of the desert, riding through the sagebrush checking cows, I spoke to a friend and co-worker, Holly. Our talk up to this point had been pretty tame, none of the mill stuff. All of a sudden, our talk shifted, and we began talking about her involvement with an organization called Justice 61. Justice 61 is dedicated to helping people that are in the sex trafficking trade. She began to tell me how women, mainly, would be targeted through abusive relationships, lack of confidence, and lack of self-worth. And I just heard God telling me that this was it. This was something I could use to help me with, to help others, to use it for his glory, what he'd wanted all along. The song Like a Child by Jars of Clay popped into my head at that moment. They say that I can move the mountains and send them falling to the sea. They say that I can walk on water if I would follow and believe with faith like a child. They say that love can heal the broken. They say that hope can make you see. They say that faith can find a savior if you would follow and believe with faith like a child. I now know that with faith like a child, I can go where God leads me. Abraham Lincoln. Samson, Harriet Tubman, Abraham, Martin Luther King Jr., Peter, J.K. Rowling, Barnabas' nephew, John Mark, the one who wrote the book we just studied, Bill Gates, King David, and Albert Einstein. Each of those names, each of those people, are part of an elite group. They all experienced dismal failure. But they would not allow failure to be the final word. Some of them trusted God. Some of them pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps, or so they think. But they all experienced disappointment, disillusionment, pain. And they did not allow it to define them. Maybe you have experienced pain. Maybe you've been disillusioned with God, with a friend that you wrote off years ago. Maybe you've had failure after failure. Maybe you've made mistakes or you just flat out sinned. Jesus is not done with you and your failure is not final. That's what this entire book is about. Jesus wants to work in your life even more now because with God failure is never ever final 
I think if I were to summarize what I think he wants us to learn from this passage, and I think it's a good summary of the book, is that he would challenge us to follow him through our pain and failure to the future he has for us. The pathway through your pain leads to the future. If you want to go to the future with God, you have to walk through it. You have to allow him to strengthen you through it. You have to allow him to work in you. I don't know if, if there's anything that's kind of risen to the surface as we've been talking today. Maybe something you connected with what Rachel had to say. Maybe something you connected with, with some of the music or, or what we've said so far from God's word. Even as you hear that name, Peter. I want to take just a minute or two and pray. I want to give you an opportunity to just bring that to God, whatever it might be. And I want to offer, in the pew in front of you, as Garrett pointed out, there's, a, there's a three different cards. One of them is a prayer card. If you have something you'd like for us to be praying with about you, for you, with you, about, please fill that out and drop it in the offering plate when it comes by. If you want to get together and talk, um, put your information on there. We can talk. would love to do that. One of the greatest tragedies, I think, that we can do to ourselves or to anyone else around us is to keep our struggles to ourselves. We don't need to tell everybody. But James 5.16 says that if we confess our faults to one another, we'll find healing for our souls. Not salvation. Jesus does that. But the hurt, the pain that's in your soul because of the wrong that you have had done against you or that you've done. God wants you to know your failure is not final. I want to use that failure because you're not a failure. You're my precious child. Maybe you're here and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus and you've never become his child. Today could be the day for you to do that. So let's all bow our heads, close our eyes. No one's going to look around. I'm not even looking around. Take some time and bring whatever the issue is to God that he's brought onto your mind and talk to him about it. Father, you know what's on each of our hearts and minds. You know the struggles. You know the pain that we have felt that either we inflicted or have had inflicted on us and the guilt or shame we've lugged around. I'm so grateful that you don't want us to carry that around anymore, that you tell us that if we come to you, the burden that you will have us carry will be light and the yoke will be easy. So, we come to you right now and we offer this painful thing to you. And we ask you to meet us at the point of pain and take us to that place of a fruitful and joyous life that you have waiting for us through that pain. You've never trusted Jesus. It's as simple as acknowledging that you are a sinner in need of a savior and you invite him into your life. Use your own words. If you want some help, here's, here's a simple prayer you could pray. Jesus, I am a sinner, I'm broken. And I come to you right now with all my brokenness and I offer myself to you. Please forgive me. Please come into my life. Make me your son or daughter. Thank you for the spirit who lives inside of me to enable me to walk with you so that I can pray with others. Your kingdom come, your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. If you put your faith and trust in and uh, Christ,
Christ today, uh, uh, again, that card, you can just put it on there and made a decision for Jesus. Make sure we have your contact information. I'd love to follow up with you this week. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to serve a God who really loves us and, and sees the flaws and the, the, the failures and all those things in us. And he doesn't turn away. He doesn't reject us. He accepts us. And he sees us through that pain. Garrett?